Hey, everybody. Uh, looks like we're getting it started in 10 seconds. Uh, I'm Kartik. I work at F1 Call A Capital, and, uh, and I'll be the moderator for, uh, for this evening. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll just have everybody start and uh, just kind of do a quick intro to, uh, to who they are and, and sort of the company and the product they represent, and we'll just kind of start from there and, uh, and get this going. So I'll, I'll start with Eric. Hey, I'm Eric Weiner. I work for Gemini. I'm the VP of engineering there. Um, was one of the early employees. Gemini is uh, uh, the world's most fully regulated and licensed cryptocurrency exchange and custodian. Uh, we've been in the business for, uh, launched a little over four years now. Uh, been securing crypto ever since. Hi, I'm Ben Chan. I'm the CTO at BitGo. So BitGo is a scalability and security wallet platform for blockchain. Um, we've been around since 2013. We transact over $10 billion a month and we do about more than 15% of uh, all the global Bitcoin transaction volume today uh, on-chain. Um, we have a trust license from the Division of Banking of South Dakota, uh, making us one of the first uh, regulated uh, custodians for purpose-built for digital assets. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to sit here next to those giants next to me. Um, my name is Lior Lamesh. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, GK8. Um, I earned my stripes in uh, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the world for cybersecurity, uh, in the Israeli Prime Minister's office. Uh, I was part of an elite team that protected the strategic assets of Israel from cybersecurity attacks. Um, now, our intro to cryptocurrency was very interesting. When um, more than two years ago, we encountered, we encountered uh, for the first time in the state of the art of the other wallet um, and we actually hacked it in four days. And what we realized was there are not real cold wallets at the market. And the reason is that they're all connected to the internet at some point. Um, so then we tried to think if could it be an option to make a fully operational cold wallet with no internet connection at all. And we ended up doing exactly that. Uh, we are working today with a couple of customers that are managing more than $1 billion in cryptocurrencies. Um, and uh, we believe that um, bringing a true uh, cryptocurrency security um, will usher in a new era for uh, the new uh, economic money. Hey, I'm Boaz. I'm the head of product at Anchorage. Uh, Anchorage is a institutional qualified custodian for crypto assets. Um, and what we do is we allow clients a way to store assets in a way that's safer than cold storage, but still allows them to have the accessibility to those assets that they need in order to have the peace of mind to transfer assets quickly, which is a, something that clients require, but also to do the more advanced forms of participation that you need to do on these blockchains. So governance, staking, uh, other kinds of much more complex interactions. These are the things that clients want in order to fulfill often their fiduciary obligation to get the best return of, on investment on these assets. Thanks, everybody. So, uh, I mean, a couple of you brought up these interesting points, and, uh, and maybe it'll be nice to sort of see if we can uh, get to some uh, consistent or inconsistent definition. So, so maybe a question I have for all of you is, and we will start with uh, Boaz, um, what does cold storage mean to you um, and, and the product uh, that's Anchorage? And kind of with that, like, how does that definition, from your perspective, change uh, as we kind of, as the tech evolves? So anywhere from new consensus mechanisms to new curves to, to new way of thinking about using these assets. Uh, what is the definition of cold storage is? What is it now and what does it become over time? Cold storage is uh, a way of keeping assets offline that fundamentally, the way the industry talks about it today, requires human beings in the mix. And human beings are known for making mistakes when they follow all of these complex checklists in order to generate assets uh, in a secure environment, distribute these keys around the world into vaults, and then assemble them back together. Um, so we don't believe, while we believe in the value of keeping assets offline, uh, we don't believe that a uh, cold storage solution that requires humans is a way that will allow us to scale uh, as crypto has more and more requirements for more active participations. We can take traditional uh, security practices, security practices from the modern uh, security industry that payment companies have, that uh, governments have, uh, and bring that into the crypto industry to build best-in-class security that isn't cold storage. Thanks. And maybe, Leo, you, you had a, a thread going, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, too. 
Uh, sure. So based on our experience with our customers, uh, I feel that the level of the conversation is in much more higher. I think that most of the clients are pretty confused because uh, from the one end, they think of blockchain as something that is decentralized and secure enough. But eventually, the key seal of the technology is the end users that support to, that's supposed to protect and manage the private keys. Um, and what we do in order to help them understand how it's getting better is the fact that we do the whole communication process with the blockchain without the internet connection. And then the major uh, uh, question is how do we do it? Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. The, um, you know, cold storage means air gapped, uh, something that doesn't have a connection to the internet. There's a lot of people doing, saying they're doing cold storage, but not actually doing cold storage, uh, where you're plugging something into your computer that's sitting in your desk drawer, and that's, that becomes hot for the time it's plugged into your computer. Uh, so I appreciate you not calling a solution that's not cold storage, cold storage, and then being able to deal with the ramifications of that. Um, but we still believe at Gemini that, that, there's, that there's no substitute for that air gap. Um, that even with all of the systems we put in place around account security when you're going into the website to make a, make a withdrawal request or anything that, uh, on, your, on, your, uh, on your account, we have all of the amazing account security stuff we built to support the exchange, we've got them enabled for custody, um, but even then, we want to have uh, a double check, a triple check, uh, physical media, literally getting into a car, going to a place, getting into a vault. Um, we feel like the physical security controls, the governance controls, the biometric controls around an air-gapped wallet um, give us and give our customers uh, the peace of mind they deserve. Yeah, um, so I believe that cold storage is one of the more, more, more important uh, pieces of the puzzle in creating a secure solution. Um, there are many components of that. It could be uh, components uh, that you basically talk about people, um, physical uh, levels of security, uh, you talk about process, you talk about technology, and cold storage is just one of those. So with cold storage, I, I'd agree, it's, it's a setup where you want to make sure that the keys are offline or cold, and that there is an air gap between any online components and any offline components. And, and the advantage here is, is mainly that with the offline component, you have a machine which uh, must never be connected to the internet uh, one way or the other and should not uh, be uh, allowed uh, to, to have new software like malware that could get on, onto it. Um, I think it's very important. Uh, since 2018, I think uh, you can look up the stats, but it's even more than a billion at this point has been lost in, in cryptocurrency hacks and, and various uh, you know, theft. And uh, in, in many of those cases, um, it, it, those, those keys were online. Thanks, and uh, I guess the email is like we're, we're mostly consistent on those answers, so maybe I'll, I'll try to uh, spin it up on the other side of this equation, which is um, what do you, or, or actually can you describe us to a regulator, what does that mean um, for, what, is, what, is it, what does it mean for them to have a, a, a custodian uh, from the traditional definitions uh, of what it means to custody assets as well as uh, what are the differences, or I guess, like, where's the mismatch of, like, anywhere from definition to technological that um, is uh, inconsistent with the world of crypto? I mean, so we have a, what we found is that, first of all, the, the regulators that we have the closest relationship with are the ones that see the value of crypto, um, especially for custodians. Um, we have a, we're regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services as a trust company, and um, and what we can really show them is by having customer assets segregated into their own addresses on the blockchain, uh, it's auditable by us, by the customer, by the regulator, by our auditors. And, uh, and that just exposes all sorts of new possibilities. A lot of the classical custodians, uh, when these regulators think of the terms, are paperwork managers. And they have to have all these procedures to make sure that they're correctly managing their paperwork. Um, the fact that we can leverage the blockchain to take some of that burden off ourselves, off our customers, and, uh, and expose it to whoever needs it exposed to um, can add value to the whole space. And so uh, regulators really look to, to companies like Gemini and everybody else on the stage as, as the future of custodianship for everything. Um, yeah, so you asked about how some of them take a look and, and at traditional assets, maybe like gold, and try to you know, draw parallels uh, in, in the crypto world. And I think there's some of that, and a lot of learnings we can get there. 
um, somewhat of why, why it is important to be, to be regulated and to follow um, all these processes and, and uh, make sure that you're, you're producing you know, uh, quality or quarterly or monthly reports, uh, making sure that you're, you're following all the audits, is because uh, many of our clients actually have a fidu fiduciary responsibility to some of their customers, so they are holding money on behalf of their customers as well that want to receive these reports to make sure that they actually hold the funds. So uh, that's on where they look at crypto as if it's a, you know, digital assets as, as if they are, uh, you know, a traditional asset side. Um, but where it gets, uh, you know, more modern today is where, you know, there are many other uh, features and, and functions that you can use digital assets for. Um, things like new passive ways to uh, earn yields like uh, staking or participating in DeFi are some of these uh, functions that you, you couldn't always do with just, you know, bars of gold in a vault. Um, so I think that the regulation think of uh, cryptocurrency the same way that they think of uh, traditional assets and I think they do it wrong. Um, I think that um, eventually in order to break into um, a traditional custody with gold, uh, you need an army. In order to break um, a, a, a cryptocurrency uh, custody, eventually it's enough to invest a couple of million dollars in order to find some uh, vulnerabilities in order to attack it. Um, so I think that hacking is about uh, ROI and the regulation should uh, adjust themselves accordingly. Uh, we talk to regulators a lot. And one of the fun things about talking to regulators is translating crypto and how crypto works onto the traditional rules that they're working with. So they care about uh, how do you prove that you actually control this asset. They care about how does this get audited. What they see when, they, uh, when we talk about crypto is not necessarily this new network. They see bearer assets, something that we've been working hard to get rid of, uh, that can be photocopied. And so they really need to hold custodians to a very high standard. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, things like more active participation, like Ben was talking about, uh, uh, it's fun to both map these uh, uh, traditional things that they're used to onto what crypto does, and also uh, uh, work with them to understand that it, uh, in crypto, the, the medium and the contract are the, are the same thing. They're not separated. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess like maybe uh, starting with Ben, um, with with kind of the answers uh, from what we just heard, how, how do you measure uh, for your product what it means to be secure and, and sort of what are the metrics that matter uh, when we're talking about custody and the security of those assets? Well, the first one is don't be hacked. <laughs> don't lose the customer funds. Um, we have been uh, doing this with many different clients uh, over quite a while. And for us, it's got to be a level slightly higher than that. It's not only that w we mustn't do anything wrong on our side, but that we need to give them an end-to-end -end process or an end-to-end -end workflow that can um, try to minimize any single points of failure on their side. And so um, what, what's important there is not that, you know, maybe they, you don't want a situation where it wasn't your fault, but they still lost the funds, right? So what are some of the things that you can do to prevent that? You can do, say, things like, you know, one of the largest single points of failure, in my opinion, is when you receive a new, a new destination address. So say I want to send some funds to you. Um, many a time, people will send it over in an email. And no matter how secure you are with multi-sig, multi multi-key, vaults, cold storage, um, if that email account had somehow been hacked or was not you know, well, well encrypted, um, then that address is, is going to be the single point of failure. Right? You're going to just send the funds to the wrong address. And so it's how, to, how do we work with uh, our clients to uh, fashion a, a good set of policies and processes? Um, for example, whitelisting policies, whenever they're sending to a new address, um, that uh, you know, we, we care a lot about. Um, so I believe that um, the existing ways to measure the risks are not good enough. Um, Eventually, cryptocurrency security involves two parts, uh, hot wallets and cold wallets. And when it comes to the hot wallet solution, the best thing you can do is uh, decentralize the risk using multi-sig uh, solutions. Uh, but eventually, hackers would invest millions to steal billions. And uh, it would be enough to invest a million dollars to hack any different network out there. So it would be enough to hack a, a whole um, system of uh, multi-sig. 
And on the other hand, when it comes to cold wallets, so as I said before, the cold wallets today are not really cold because they're using some kind of connection in order to create a valid transaction, whether if they are based on uh, cables, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, QR codes, or SD cards, um, and such kind of connection are uh, opening uh, new attack vectors. Um, and I think that the best way uh, to uh, solve this problem is to find a real way to make the whole communication without taking any data from the internet. And that's exactly what we are operating in a GK8 based on uh, a only unidirectional approach, so there is no any potential attack vector. Um, I think security, when you measure it, uh, people often are talking about safekeeping. How are you storing the keys? Uh, how are they accessed directly? Um, and a lot of times that's what clients are, are, are used to talking about or used to thinking about. But that's one piece uh, uh, of, of just, just really one third of the, of the problem of security. Um, you have to have the ability to access these keys in a way that's secure, in a way that doesn't use the device that you're using to assign them as a signing oracle, in a way that doesn't rely on humans who can make mistakes. But you also need to identify instructions from the user all the way and make sure that those end-to-end -end security, from the point that the user instructs you to do something until the point that, that you uh, do that thing, uh, uh, is irrefutable. And you need to make sure that the people who are instructing you to do this thing are who you expect. You need to identify them. Uh, you need with biometrics, uh, with risk metrics, with all of the things that you can use to know, uh, is this the complete picture? Is this this institution's intent? We're not working with retail solely with institutions. Um, that we've covered end to end every single possible place where uh, uncertainty can enter the system. Um, I think just to add a little on that, I think it's a, uh, yeah, you've got to think about the whole system from a, from a customer requesting some action all the way through executing that action and everything that can happen from here to there, anything that can go wrong from that here to there. Um, the other things that we often want to be mindful of is, um, is, is the internal threats, uh, whether somebody's going rogue at the company, whether somebody's been, um, been held for ransom or kidnapped got to have plans around those. You got to think about your supply chain. Um, so everything that goes into that signing operation, everything that goes into every piece of software and every piece of hardware um, from the factory out through the operational system, every, every data center it's touching, um, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, uh, every piece of media it's touching, where did that come from? What could go wrong? What could somebody who's well-funded enough, if you're storing billions and billions of dollars, you could spend a billion dollars trying to hack into these things. So you've got to think, if somebody were to spend a billion dollars trying to hack this, if they were to occupy a, a factory, if they were to, um, to kidnap an employee, if they were to uh, cause a physical disruption at, at, a, at, a, at the office or at, a, um, at one of our lo like vault locations, what could they do about it? And to have to have a plan around that, um, which can get pretty hairy, but it's, it's important to do uh, if you're storing this kind of money. I guess only the paranoid survive, huh? <laughs> um, I guess w with that, uh, I do have a lot of follow-up questions, I'll, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask them after this. Um, what are the most common questions that you get from your customers when they're when, tr when they're trying this out? And and I guess if you were to just like sort of hint uh, from like low, medium to high on um, the average customer that you talk to, how how knowledgeable are they about uh, the intricacies of the asset that they're custodying with you? Um, and and kind of like, have you seen any trends in in sort of uh, that being uh, that getting better in terms of them understanding it more, or, or is it more about just delegation, where like they know they have to use something, so they kind of just pass that on? I mean, uh, the constant has been that people are interested in in auditing and regulation, and are we following the procedures we say we follow? Do we have a SOC two certification? Are we regulated by an appropriate regulator? Um, are we doing what we say we do? Uh, I think the new thing has been I've seen a huge increase in the sophistication, the te technical sophistication. Of our of our customers over the last year, um, most people coming in the door today they know what an HSM is. If they're really fancy, they know the difference between FIPS 140-2 level three and level four. Um, a year ago, we were talking to people about what a hardware security module was, and four years ago, we were talking to the HSM manufacturers about what Bitcoin is. And so, to see that change in the last five years has been incredible. 
Yeah, I think to some extent they're, they're getting a little bit more sophisticated. They've been asking more about how we deal with smart contracts, for instance. Um, but I think for the most part, uh, many of the clients that come to us, uh, uh, you know, they've, we've been around, they, can kind of, they, they do trust us there, we have a SOC 2, and they are really interested in how we can work to them, with them together to uh, come up with the best policy configurations and the best um, setup of a you know, hot, warm, or cold environment uh, system that they can then um, uh, use which which actually uh, is suitable for the operational requirements of the speed to transact um, and uh, we, we we have that that discussion with almost every client um, and uh, you know I think that 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 good mix of using the right technology um, for the right purpose um, is is what uh, people really value a lot uh, so for us as on premise solution um, the thing that the, our customers most uh, interested of is the security, the functionality, and how many cryptocurrency we support. Um, I think that the most important thing for them is to understand that it's not only a wallet, not only something that's protecting from uh, uh, mostly cyber security attacks, but also uh, a full system to manage digital assets. Uh, it should include uh, authentication methods and user management that's uh, meeting uh, large institution needs, um, and as well as uh, physical protection and flexibility. Um, I mean, to answer your question, on balance, clients are, are very sophisticated. Um, they're not all security experts. And the ones that are security experts, we explain to them how our product works, and they understand immediately that, that we're the safest custodian. Um, the, uh, the, the rest under, have this uh, latent kind of understanding that the blockchain is irreversible. And any transaction that goes out there uh, can never be clawed back. Um, and so. They have to have the trust, that end-to-end -end trust in us, um, that, uh, that the transactions that go out are the transactions that they intend. Um, uh, after that, they always uh, uh, care about uh, forms of active participation, staking governance. Uh, they care about new assets, tail assets, as well as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, and they care about how these assets are going to change over time. That, that's actually perfect, because that was sort of my next question. Um, the, the, the good and the bad thing about this space is that it's, things move so, super fast uh, from purely just a technological standpoint. So uh, anywhere from kind of seeing new consensus mechanisms to new signing curves to new assets kind of coming on board or being announced. Um, when that happens, um, given the lag time in a way for kind of something to mature or, or be supported by, by one of your products or one of you in general, um, and in general the maturity of those projects, uh, how do you prioritize uh, what to think about, what to support, or, or kind of when do you kind of manage the needs of your customer versus where the technology is headed or where you think it's going to head? Uh, how, how does that work internally and then for each of you? Maybe we can start with uh, Boaz. We prioritize the needs of our clients always. Uh, and we have to understand what are, the, what are the clients' needs today and what are the clients' needs tomorrow. And those needs tomorrow are going to be the ability to continue to participate with the level of safety uh, and the level of scale that they, uh, that they will need in order to move funds as volatility increases or decreases as types of participation change. Um, beyond that, uh, there's uh, tons of new projects. I think I've talked to a dozen projects that are launching by the end of the year. Uh, you can only uh, support a portion of them, so we prioritize, again, based on our client needs, um, and over time, we'll support all assets. Um, so, of course, the existing clients are the most important one, and we should do what it takes in order to meet their needs. Uh, but I think that as the crypto industry uh, growing, there are new um, signing algorithms like EDDSA and new other cryptocurrencies. Uh, they should, you should always be there. Um, at the time in order to support them and not staying behind. Um, so it's also something that uh, you should take under consideration in order to get ready to the next clients. Uh, well, I think you have to prioritize clients, but you also have to prioritize security. Uh, you know, uh, and that's, that's a balance that we always have to go through uh, on a daily basis. In terms of uh, adding you know, new chains, new curves, and so on, uh, what I've you know, what, what we've been seeing more recently is actually requests to do more in terms of active participation in, or even passive participation um, in terms of uh, the features, uh, even on existing chains. So that's going a little bit more deep than, than so wide. You know, um, maybe a year ago, it was all about supporting a thousand different assets. 
Um, but today, it's you know some people have assets that they have already, and they want to stake those assets, and they want to participate in you know online uh, DeFi lending, or um, make trades on certain DEXs that they would otherwise be unable to, or participate in governance. And I think that's a sign of um, you know certain platforms becoming a little bit more mature um, in that they can actually perform these functions. Um, and we're seeing a lot of, of activity there. On the institutional side, I think it's very important to prioritize uh, compliance and security. And uh, mostly there, we're, we're seeing just the ask of uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah, we see a lot of the same thing. Um, you know, there's a ton of new assets coming out, a ton of new coins, a ton of fascinating technology coming through. Uh, it's definitely in the next year. Um, there's probably going to be few winners. Um, and we're not, uh, and while we can sense the needs of our clients and try to try to anticipate them, um, you can see these trends coming along, you know, uh, staking coins, layer two protocols, and, and try to make sure that we're covering all the right bases around the different categories of new, of new innovations in the blockchain space, um, and including going deeper in, you know, existing assets. Uh, luckily, I mean, I think thankfully, um, Clients, uh, all of our clients, I imagine, are sophisticated enough to understand that um, that security and accessibility and reliability these are things that um, that you have to trade off to some extent. Um, you can try to maximize everything to the best of everybody's ability, um, but they're not going to go complain if you say, "Look, this chain technically requires you to be, you know, literally online signing something every 30 seconds and uh, in order to do this particular operation, and we just don't feel like that there's any way to do that without sacrificing the air gap nature of our cold wallet. While this other chain has the same operation, but you can delegate the authority to a less, um, a less risky hot wallet, so we'd rather be able to support this other chain. Um, those are the sorts of things that as I talk to blockchain develop people making new blockchains, I, I, we, we like to say, you know, think about um, whether whether you really need that new signing curve because does, does everybody's hardware support it? Um, are you really going to make me stay online with a billion dollars worth of assets when there's a way to avoid that? Why do they listen? Do they listen to you? Actually, yeah, sometimes they do. That's great. So, so standardizations are always great, but uh, that's the problem with standards. There are too many. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so especially when talking about staking and the online requirement for staking, um, I think that uh, many of them actually value having insurance. <laughs> and to some extent, um, when you go out there and you try and uh, explain your process to uh, the people that are, you know, uh, Lloyd Syndicate, for example, you're, you're really telling them, okay, here's how we store uh, and secure uh, these coins in, in cold storage. And these are the processes that would, you know, uh, allow for withdrawal. Um, and I think one thing that does work with our clients is that it, it, they, they really do enjoy being able to stake, for example, out of cold storage if you can delegate the key out to hot. Um, but the moment you have to uh, move that and, 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 and put assets at risk in an online environment, then they will lose um, some of that, uh, gar those guarantees and insurance, and that's not something that they you know, want. So they, they see the same, they're on the same level with that. There are already, though, popular assets today that don't have that ability. I think you all have Cosmos on your uh, lanyard. In order to be a responsible custodian of Cosmos, you have to be able to delegate those assets and periodically on-chain reclaim those assets and redelegate them to get your compounding returns. Um, and that's not uh, for Cosmos, for these networks to build ways around that. They'll be building things uh, to support institutional custody instead of building the things to support the network when institutional custody should be able to with a high level of security, support the requirements uh, of these assets. And Eric, you kind of touched on this thing, but uh, I guess if we were to sort of project that into the future, like what do you think from like a technical standpoint are sort of the bottlenecks for us to either make the industry or just the scale for uh, the custodians to operate at like 10 to 100x uh, level? Like kind of what, what's stopping that from right now or is that even a, a limit that we have? bring it on if we've got 100x the assets to bring in. I mean, signing is signing. Um, luckily, that scales pretty well. Uh, I think the biggest things that, we're, that we've been, that we see as customer de demand and iterating on are the things that aren't necessarily related to the blockchains themselves. Um, features like a, a sub-accounting that more reflects 
uh, how a customer wants to handle assets, segregate their assets within their organization, segregate roles and responsibilities within their organization, um, account security features so that we know that the customer requesting a, an action is in fact the correct customer. Um, those are the big points that we need to um, continue working on. Uh, you know, I think we're all doing a great job of that. Need to keep on working on. You know, we've got WebAuthn for two-factor authentication. We've got whitelisting. We've got all sorts of roles and responsibilities. Uh, dele delegation management within our platform. Um, that's where I think the iteration needs to be in order to scale this thing way, way up. Well, so there's a couple of challenges in that question. The first one is uh, scalability. Um, how can we make enough transactions per second? Um, and so with that, you're talking about supporting maybe certain other uh, scalability layers um, and also um, being able to really uh, have, have infrastructure that can monitor, say, hundreds of millions of addresses. And, uh, you, know, you know, BitGo has been doing this for a while, so we kind of can extrapolate what kind of uh, infrastructure we would need to do that. I think the security side is a little bit uh, more of a cause for concern because if the industry grows, you know, 10, 10 or 100 times, that's where, uh, you know, you've got to be thinking about, uh, you know, what we spoke about earlier, right, which is um, suddenly uh, what someone had invested in a billion dollars, they might want to go after your trillion dollar wallet now, and you have to be prepared for that. So uh, there, there are many features that we have today. Um, for example, things like, you know, web ball then, like you mentioned, things like, uh, being able to build a uh, high context 2FA, where instead of just typing in, you know, the six digits, you have a separate device that agrees to, you know, the destination and the amount. And um, I think something that uh, has been starting to come up, um, this, this, this term known as, uh, you know, uh, progressive onboarding, where you start with, uh, and, and, and the user experience is very important. You know, you don't want to tell people everything is offline all the time because it could be a trillion dollars, because today it's just a thousand dollars, right? Um, so when they start with smaller wallets, uh, you want to give them some flexibility in the policy setting on how much they can move a day. And as the value of that goes up, um, then you need to proactively tell them, uh, hey, add a second, a second signer, uh, add a second uh, a group of people here, a second tier, um, and add, add additional policies, and and uh, put some of that in code. And um, it's really being able to apply all of this and being ready with them in, 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 in such a case. Uh, so I think that uh, from the scalability uh, aspects, um, the institution needs on-premise uh, digital assets management, at least for part of the money, in order to meet their, uh, to, to reduce the time consuming needs. Um, and when it comes to the security aspect, um, so uh, as we said uh, before, uh, eventually, um, hacking is about ROI. Hackers will definitely target the hot wallets. Uh, every wallet today is hot wallet. And um, that's why people should be uh, ready and to have better security in order to avoid uh, such attacks of uh, state level hackers that would invest a large amount of money to steal your money. Um, as the industry scales and starts to look more like traditional finance, uh, a few things will happen. Some these guys already touched on. One, the value of the assets goes up, and that's why it's important. That's why we've built uh, a, a system that can custody a hundred billion, a trillion dollars with that level of security. Um, the second is that the number of clients goes up, not just the value, and along with the number of clients, the number of transactions, both for the traditional transfer in, transfer out. Uh, which are sometimes uncorrelated, sometimes correlated based on moves in the market. Uh, and a big, big rush of transactions is something that uh, uh, a modern technical solution um, that can, with safer, with as safer, safer than cold storage uh, uh, security, access these assets is something that's needed. Um, as well as uh, the more the industry will grow, the forms of participation will continue to grow. Um, so all of these things together uh, will require a more robust industry, whereas the regulators will still expect the same thing that they expect now, because that's what we're training them to expect. Uh, I think that's something to add, uh, in addition to all of this, is that when you actually have an industry that is, you know, trillion dollars large, um, having interoperability between uh, different custodians is going to be super important. 
Um, if you look at you know, traditional finance, there's not just one custodian, not just one exchange. There are many of them, and you, many um, funds often split their funds. Uh, split, split their assets amongst multiple custodians. And what's important is going to be able to uh, work out uh, interoperability uh, standards between us and how we can uh, safely uh, settle up between custodians, could be atomically, um, or you know, when we're sending from one, client to the, uh, one client's account and one custodian to the other, how can we ensure that that's going to be secure end to end? And so I think that's something that uh, we would need to start thinking about as well. I was going to say, we kind of already touched it, but uh, I, I guess like as the industry becomes bigger uh, in terms of AUM or, or users, um, do you think it's sort of at odds of uh, being centralized? Or, or like how do you measure decentralization at that point? And does that, is that a relevant question? Um, how do you sort of mitigate risk in terms of central failure of risk? I mean, I, I really... Uh so you really dislike the decentralization versus centralization as a debate or as a spectrum. Um, I think the, the value of blockchains is that you can always build a centralized layer on top of a decentralized system, but you can't go vice versa. So in the old school financial system, we had a centralized base layer, and there's nothing you can do to make that decentralized. Um, but with blockchains, we've got a decentralized base layer. We can build centralized systems where they make sense, and that doesn't make it's not, it's not uh, against the concepts of blockchains. It's not, it's not bad for Bitcoin. Um, it's good for the customers who, who need that kind of functionality, who need somebody that they can trust in that's going to be regulated, that's going to be secure, that's going to take the load off of them when they don't have the, the technical or security sophistication to build the kinds of systems that we've all built. Um, so I think that's complementary. Uh, it's just it was impossible to do before. I totally agree. Institutions specifically need and want centralized custody. But what that does is it allows uh, crypto assets being adopted by institutions to be mainstreamed. And the core aspects of those crypto assets, uh, if they're permissionless, if they're trustless, uh, those still remain true. And so by legitimizing these assets further in the eyes of traditional Wall Street, traditional institutions, we're allowing everyone else to gain the benefits of participating in those assets. I think we should get the benefit of both of them. Uh, I think that mostly the decentralization protecting from inside jobs and uh, decentralization uh, within the custodians should protect the cybersecurity attacks. So I don't think they should go one against the other. Yeah, um, I, like, I like your opinion. Um, being able to be decentralized if you want to choose to hold uh, you know, your own property is a, is a huge feature. Um, of many of, of these uh, blockchains today. Um, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, like I said, we're gonna see multiple custodians uh, in a world where you have 10 times or 100 times the amount of AUM. But just as importantly, um, we're gonna see custodians in different geographical locations. And this is a, you know, a trend that I've, I've started to see where many clients in separate countries like Asia or Europe are starting to ask for uh, presence uh, in those areas. Um, and kind of just with that, I'd like to ask one final question before we wrap up the panel. Um, I guess for each of you, what has been the, the most fun asset to integrate on the platform uh, and why? Um, a while ago, we uh, added the ability to, to signal Edgeware for, uh, for airdropping uh, on the Ethereum network. And um, we thought that was great, the, a great ability to to allow our clients who store Ethereum, over 20% of our clients did this, and they also moved assets in to, to be signaled um, uh, in order to actually get the most out of their Ethereum. Now they have Ethereum and they have this other free money. Uh, so I think the most fun or, or challenge one is uh, support the SE20, um, especially because of the fact that you need to have external uh, account for the gas. Um, that's what I found the most fun part. Uh, so for me, it's Ethereum. Um, you know, now it might seem like it's one of the older smart contract chains, but it was the first one for me. Um, we built, you know, the first web-based uh, uh, multi-sig wallet for Ethereum, and and what was interesting uh, was back in 2016, uh, you know, we built it just for Ethereum, but people had sent money from it to uh, get into this DAO ICO. And uh, we didn't know how to hold DAO. So uh, it got into a lot of cases where we were just learning as we were going at a time. And it was, it was you know, many things that we've come to, to discover over the years and, and what features people want and what you have to, to expect them to do. 
Yeah, I mean, totally the same. I'm, uh, Ethereum seems like old news right now, but we've all got some more stories of the early days of it, I'm sure, um, whether it was trying to support the DAO or even just trying to track ethers going around the network, which uh, a lot of people who are early core developers of Ethereum basically said they forgot to build support for. Smart contract transactions. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, it, and so uh, when, we were, when we were launching ERC-20 support for our custody solution, um, we had to go, we went and evaluated all the different contract uh, holding contracts we could find and found little flaws, little bugs, and a lot of them. We've spent a lot of emails to people, uh, had to go with ourselves, and because Ethereum is is this proto thing that is was still trying is still trying to figure out uh, all its best practices, um, we were really scared about getting something wrong. Had to spend a ton of time making sure we got it right. Well, with that, thank you so much for uh, for joining us, and uh, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.